Well, hello everybody. Today we're going to be talking about the emotional and social development of infants and toddlers. And we'll start off with a video to show you what's happening during this very exciting stage. In two years, children will progress from the speedy, uncensored reactions of infancy to the complex responses of toddlerhood. It begins with pleasure and pain. Newborns look happy and relaxed when they're fed and drifting off to sleep. They cry when they're hurt, hungry, tired, or frightened. Emotions such as curiosity and happiness soon become recognizable. Around three or four months of age, laughter appears. Laughter and curiosity build together. That's why infants enjoy games that balance familiarity and surprise, such as peekaboo. Sadness is evident in the first months, and by six months, anger typically emerges, usually triggered by an infant's frustration, such as being confined when they'd rather explore. Fear, in response to some person, thing, or situation, emerges at about nine months. There are two kinds of obvious social fears. Stranger wariness, which an infant expresses by no longer smiling at friendly faces, or by crying in the presence of an unfamiliar person. And separation anxiety, which an infant expresses in tears, dismay, or anger when a familiar caregiver leaves. You can really see how she'll take her cue from us and, and watch what, how we're reacting. And we, of course, try to be very upbeat and positive um, in introducing this new person to her. And then once they see, she sees that our reaction is fav favorable, she'll slowly then, I would say over the course of, oh, five minutes, ten minutes, get used to that person. Emotions that emerged in the first months of life change throughout the second year. Anger and fear typically become less frequent, but more focused. Laughing and crying become louder and more discriminating. As toddlers gain an awareness of other people, new emotions appear, such as shame, embarrassment, and pride. By age two, children can display the entire spectrum of emotional reactions. Emotional bonds develop between infants and caregivers from the very beginning. Parents across the world communicate with their infants through nonverbal emotional exchanges. This coordinated emotional interaction is called synchrony and helps teach infants how to read and express a variety of emotions. As infants become more responsive social partners, synchrony becomes more frequent and elaborate. By 12 months, with most infants walking and talking, face-to-face -face social interaction lessens and synchrony is overtaken by another important connection. Attachment is a lasting emotional bond that forms in early infancy and solidifies by a child's first birthday. The level of security that's felt in this child-parent bond can influence how the child connects with other people and can form an emotional framework that lasts a lifetime. So these are some of the concepts we'll be talking about. We'll start with temperament, uh, with temperament being a biologically based kind of inborn style of the way that a child approaches the world. And we're talking about um, even from a very young baby, we kind of can divide temperament into two main categories. Um, easy versus difficult. And again, this is kind of a stable approach that this infant has um, across time, across situations, how a child copes with, perceives, and interacts with his or her environment. And you could imagine um, two children, 
right, um, who are presented with the same task. Now, these are little tiny children, but let's imagine um, three, a three-year-old, um, and you ask a three-year-old to clean their room. And one three-year-old who's easygoing will just say, all right, sure, don't really want to do it, but I'll do it. More difficult temperament might put up a little bit of a fit and cry and scream and say, I don't want to do it. And you can see this from very early on. And believe me, I know because I have two daughters. Uh, my first daughter was very, very difficult in her temperament. And the second one was very easy. And it's right from the start that my first daughter was that colicky, crying. Everything was just upsetting to her um, from birth. And the other, my second daughter, was just was just easier going. Whatever we did was okay, um, and that just that's the idea of temperament. This biologically based difference um, that starts from very very early on. We're going to talk quite a bit about attachment in this chapter, and the idea here is that attachment is a powerful bond between a caregiver and child. Um, or eventually between any two people. And the concept really comes down to this idea of what forms an attachment between a caregiver and a child. Um, is it maternal reinforcement related to food, right? That as infants, children need food, and so they need a, a caregiver there to feed them. Or, um, is it kind of a bond, a soft, secure, loving bond um, that forms the attachment? And so we can start with the idea of synchrony. You saw this in the video. Uh, Parent-child interactions can be described as synchrony, this mutual exchange that requires split-second timing. So when you watch a parent and an infant, you'll see that the adult caregiver will respond to little tiny changes that are happening in the baby's facial expressions or body motions, um, almost imperceivable maybe to someone who's not that child's caregiver, but the caregiver knows what this facial expression means, what this motion means, and all of a sudden they'll be picking the baby up or changing the baby's diaper. They just seem to be in synchrony um, with what the child needs. And this helps infants connect and feel understood within the family. Um, they've done some really interesting studies, these still face studies, where an infant faces an adult who responds while the video camera records both the infant and the adult. And, the adult. and parents instinctively synchronize their responses to the infant's movements, and babies reciprocate with smiles and movements, right? So um, if a baby smiles, the parent smiles back, the baby maybe laughs or giggles, and you have this whole little interaction um, where one is working synchronously with the other. Um, but then in the still-faced condition, the adult is told to stop all their expressions and just stare quietly with a still face at the baby. So the baby smiles and the adult is still face. There's not a smile or a laugh or anything. It's very unnatural. And the baby may smile again and again get no response. And you'll see that babies get very frustrated. They start to frown, fuss, kick, cry, basically saying like, hey, react to me. Remember how we do this? You make an expression. I make an expression. We work together. Um, and so you can see this frustration build up that even infants understand this idea of synchrony. And this synchronicity between a parent or a caregiver and a child um, leads to attachment. Um, starting in infancy through childhood, an attachment is this very positive emotional bond that develops between a child and an individual, it's usually their caregiver, due to these responsive relationships, right? The synchronicity in the relationships. Interestingly, this, this research originally started with monkeys. Um, Harlow was a researcher who was studying monkeys. And he was un curious about how um, monkeys and eventually humans, human infants and infant monkeys, attach and form a bond to their 
mother an event this research started many years ago and it started with the idea of an infant and a mother and so you couldn't do this research with with infants but took baby uh, monkeys and put them in a cage with two mothers again i'm using kind of air quotes here for mothers um, and we have two mothers one is a soft cloth mother and one is a wire mother but that mother has a bottle in from which the infant monkey can get milk and the question was which mother would this baby monkey attach to would he attach to the cloth monkey because it's soft and comforting or to the wire monkey because it has food and what happened was the infant monkey spent more time with the cloth monkeys cuddling up with that cloth comforting monkey and then you can see would just kind of reach over to the wire mother to get food and then go back to the cloth mother and this was the idea that comfort that touch and and comfort and cuddling and all of that stuff is really what forms an attachment it's not simply food right feeding the baby and so that was really the beginning of attachment research um, and then Bowlby continued looking at the importance of attachment between again an infant and a mother um, and then that idea grew to idea the importance of attachment to include the importance of um, a child with their father um, and a child attaching to peers and a child feeling attachment to the community to the community um, and really stimulated more research and this attachment research actually changed public policy <clears throat> for instance um, changed how we treat children in hospitals so um, before this attachment research, if a child was in the hospital, let's say with a chronic illness, and they needed to be there for a certain amount of time, uh, maybe for weeks or months, um, there were visiting hours. The child would be in the hospital. A parent could come during visiting hours to see their child, and then they had to leave. And then who would mostly take care of the children? were nurses and nurses would rotate in and out there'd be different nurses during the day different nurses each day each week etc and so the child not only was it a disadvantage because they were sick they were in the hospital um, they were missing school they were missing all sorts of things but the child wasn't getting the opportunity to attach to a caregiver um, and then and so what happened in terms of this, excuse me, attachment research is that attachment research said, hey, this is really important. Children need the ability to attach. Imagine a child, an infant who's in the hospital for six months or one or two year old who's in the hospital for six months and they're taken away from, from their parents. So now uh, parents are allowed pretty much in the hospital at all times. And so that parent and child are still able to bond and form an attachment. And again, as I say parent in this class, it's anyone who is a caregiver for that child, whether it's a biological parent, adopted parent, a grandparent, um, et cetera. Um, also the treatment of children in orphanages versus our current foster care adoption system. This is, was another change um, that was spurred on by our attachment research that when there a child was uh, not able to be cared for by their parents um, they were put into orphanages and an orphanage was basically a home and there were different people who would come work there and take care of the children and these people would come and go um, work some days not work some days and again the child really wasn't able to form an attachment so again, the child was at a disadvantage, not only because they are dealing with whatever the situation is that put them in this um, situation to be in the orphanage, um, but then they're not getting the ability to attach to an adult. And what we do find is this attachment is so important. And so we change the system. The system has changed to now a foster care um, with the goal of adoption system. So a child is put with a foster family 
and with the goal that that child then has a chance to attach and form this special bond with the foster family. Um, and then if their parent cannot take them back, then the goal would be for that child to be adopted. And so again, both of those cases, it's taking the idea of rotating caregivers for children to really allowing there to be a primary caregiver for this child to attach to. Um, so this is where psychological research really changed public policy. Um, as we said, attachment is a powerful bond between a caregiver and a child. For attachment to form, a child needs a primary attachment figure. Um, that's the closest person in the child's life. And attachment forms in unison with the idea of synchrony when the caregiver and infant respond emotionally to each other in a sensitive way. According to Bowlby, during the first three months of life, babies are in their pre-attachment phase. Um, during this time, infants so show no true signs of attachment. They're just kind of, they're just there, you know, and almost anyone can hold them and they're okay. Um, around two months of age, infants show their first social smile, um, but doesn't really reflect attachment to a person. Then around four months, infants enter this attachment in the making phase. Now babies will start to have a preference, a slight preference for their primary caregiver, but it isn't around seven, until seven or eight months that children demonstrate this clear cut attachment. Um, and now the infant needs to have the primary caregiver close by and it's evident because children will show um, stranger anxiety so when a stranger comes in the room um, the child might be frightened and run to mom or dad again whoever the caregiver is or, and separation anxiety when they're um, taken away from their attached whoever their primary attachment figure is whether it's going to grandma's house for a little bit of time or a babysitter or daycare. Oftentimes there's lots of crying because um, of the separation anxiety. All right, let's watch a little video on separation anxiety. Mom's left. We've got a very unhappy child. Hi. Mom's back again. And the baby is happy. All right. Um, infants also check with their caregiver for cues um, about how to respond when they're exploring. This is called social referencing. Um, and so when a child is in a new environment or doesn't really know what to do, they often look to their caregiver to see how the caregiver is responding, and then they in turn know how to respond. Um, so this can be when there's a new person in the room, the child doesn't know, they look to mom or dad to say, hmm, how should I respond? Oh, they're smiling. Okay, I'll smile too. Um, you see this a lot if you're, um, when you're a parent, or you might do this a lot, when uh, your child falls down and cuts their leg or something, um, scrapes their leg and they run up to you and they're like, kind of looking at you like, what should I do? And so um, as a parent, very often we go, oh, you're okay. Everything's fine. And then the child will take that on kind of social referencing and go, oh yeah, I'm fine. As opposed to if a parent goes, oh my gosh, you're bleeding. Oh my goodness, this is terrible. Then the baby or child falls apart. Um, so we use this all the time. All right, there are different attachment styles um, that we can see. Some are optimal and some are non-optimal, depending on the child caregiver relationship. And there was a lot of research done by Mary Ainsworth. She started kind of this idea of attachment styles using a particular um, experimental setup called the strain situation. And this is a way to classify 
different types of attach attachment um, using this particular test called the strain situation. And it measures individual variations in attachment during, um, you'll see, these clear-cut stages and contains planned separations and reunions of the child and the primary caregiver. So we're going to watch, this is a video of pretty much how the strange situation works. So we'll go ahead and watch this. But can the essential elements of home life be translated into a standard laboratory setting for controlled scientific study? After conducting extensive observations of parents and children at home, a student of Bowlby's, Mary Ainsworth, devised such a procedure called the strange situation, which places the child under some stress. It has become the most widely used standardized way to assess the quality of a child's attachment to their caregiver. Here, the researchers are recording how 14-month-old Lisa responds in this attractive but unfamiliar setting. How will she react to a stranger? What will happen when her mother leaves the room and when she returns? It's Lisa's behavior when her mother returns, what psychologists call the reunion, that they are particularly interested in. Most importantly is to look for the type of balance that a child strikes between an attachment need and on the other hand to explore the play material. Once Lisa has settled down to play, a stranger enters the room and sits in the chair reading a magazine. After a couple of minutes, the stranger attempts to interact with Lisa. Soon after, Lisbeth gets a cue to leave the room. The stranger tries to comfort Lisa, but in vain. Lisbeth comes back into the room and the camera records how Lisa reacts. Now the first part of the procedure is over and Lisbeth settles Lisa down again. The stranger leaves them alone together. And soon after, Lisbeth goes too. Lisa is on her own. Her distress is plain to see. Once again, the efforts of the stranger to console Lisa are to no avail. But Lisbeth manages to calm her almost at once, and shortly afterwards, the observation ends. Lisa showed outward signs of what's called secure attachment. So secure attachment being... Oh, but can sorry. Uh, the optimal type of attachment, and you can see how um, the baby was fine when mom was there, very unhappy when mom left the room, happy when mom came back. Um, this is the sign of a secure attachment that mom can kind of comfort the baby immediately. Now we're going to talk about, in this video, you'll see insecure um, and avoidant types of attachment. These are some of the um, non-optimal types of attachment and then we'll go through and talk about this in more detail but I think sometimes seeing it first can help you understand it as we go through it after. This experiment which I watched through a two-way mirror is designed to gauge how secure is the crucial relationship between mother and child. Okay, this bunny is going to go here and that bunny will be on top. 
value of the test has been established in studies that would watch a child, one year old, and then follow it up and interview them about their relationships to their parents when they were 21 years old. So we're quite confident in the long-term significance of this relationship. After several minutes play, the mother is signaled to leave the room. experiment is the child's reaction to her mother's return. The important clue is whether the baby's able to become calmed down by the contact with the mother, get back to play. Sometimes it takes a couple of minutes. But you see, when the mother was out, she was only interested in the mother, no interest in the toys. Now she has a contact with the mother, She's beginning to show a little interest in the environment, and shortly she'll be right back with the toys where we started. So you would call this a secure one? Yes, yes. She's certainly much happier. Goes to the door following her. Now, we, we sent the mother right back in, but the point here is not to distress the baby. We're just trying to challenge it. The baby puts her hands to her face in a sad expression, puts her face down, when she picks her up, she keeps her head down, her arms out, and then she sits in the chair holding the baby. The baby's still sullen. He's, he's low-keyed. So you would call the, this insecure Yes, attachment. insecure. He's avoidant. He's, he's not engaging her, and it's not be, the reunion's not effective. And it's important to remember here that the thing that upset him was her absence, her her. Return should be the solution to his problem. Now this is another pattern that we see in babies who are not good at using their mother as a secure base at home. This baby is also insecure. But you'll see, we get a look at his play before the separation. The mother's left. And when she returns, she picks him up. He can't calm down. He's still upset. She offers a toy to amuse him or to comfort him or to distract him, and he slaps it away. She offers another. He slaps it away. He's angry. He's, he's, we call these babies resistant or ambivalent because they both want her back and yet can't use the contact. We think that the difficulty is that in the past, when he sought comfort, she's been inconsistent as to whether she's available and responsive or not. All right. So that brings us to Ainsworth's attachment styles. So secure attachment, this is the optimal type of attachment between an infant and a caregiver. And this is where the parents are emotionally available, perceptive and responsive to their child. Remember, particularly when we're talking about infants and very young children, they can't talk and tell you what they need. They're crying and you've got to figure out is this is my baby hungry is this baby uh need their diaper changed are they cold are they hot and so if a parent is responsive um, and meets the child's needs in a consistent way the child will start to develop this secure trusting attachment now this does not mean that you give the child everything they want and there's no discipline in fact discipline is very important so there should be structure, there should be discipline, but that the parent is there for the child and the child starts to learn that they can trust and count on the caregiver. So the child uses the primary caregiver um, as a secure base from which to explore. I'm gonna talk about that in just a second. Um, and we saw in the video that child reacts with joy when the caregiver returns, right? Um, in that uh, strange situation, if a parent leaves, uh, caregiver leaves, the child is upset, and when the caregiver comes back, everything's okay again. Again, this is the optimal type of attachment style. Now, we have 
what's called insecure attachment styles. Um, and there's an, these are non-optimal, insecure avoidant attachment. And these are when parents are emotionally unavailable to the child. They're not responsive to their child and they're rejecting to their child. So this is a parent who isn't there. The child cries and maybe the parent ignores them. Um, they're insensitive, they lack tenderness, they're detached, and the child basically learns that they can't rely on the caregiver because they can cry, they can make a fuss, they can show their caregiver that they need something and they'll just be annoyed, um, ignored. And so this is what we call an avoidant attachment, where a parent is not really perceptive or responsive to their child, and the child learns they can't really count on their um, caregiver to get their needs met. Um, and when in the um, secure or the strange situation, um, the child appears detached. When the parent comes back, they're pretty indifferent. And then this is another type of insecure attachment style. We call it anxious ambivalent. When we see an anxious ambivalent type of attachment style, this typically occurs when parents are inconsistently available to, or perceptive or responsive. And the key here is inconsistent, meaning that sometimes when the child cries, when the parent is feeling in the mood to be a parent, they're there, they're helping the child, they're giving the child what the child needs. But there are times when the child cries and the parent is really not interested in helping or doing what, what needs to be done and they ignore the child. So it's a very inconsistent parenting style. And so what does the child learn? That they don't know what they can expect. Sometimes they cry and they get a response. Sometimes they cry and they don't get a response. This leads to a lot of anxiety because they really don't know what to expect. And so you see clingy, fearful um, children in this type of situation. Um, you'll see severe distress when the mother leaves in that strange situation. And then those contradictory emotions upon res return. The child can still be inconsolable and crying. It's just like they just don't know what to do. And this really has to do with this inconsistent parenting style. And the last of the insecure attachments we call disorganized. And this is when parents are frightening, um, frightened, alarming, abusive. This is a terrible parenting style. Um, and so this is really difficult for children who, again, have to rely on their caregiver for all of their needs to be met. But if you have a parent who's abusive or neglectful, um, it leads to a very um, non-optimal attachment style. Um, bizarre behaviors in the child, they may freeze, look frightened, they might try to run away from their parent, um, and that's kind of what you're looking at in that disorganized attachment style. Here's the idea of uh, what we were just talking about, the secure base. So when you see um, a secure attachment between a child and a caregiver, um, there are some key terms and key uh, behaviors that you'll see. Uh, so let's see, number one, proximity maintenance, uh, that to stay near uh, the people, and maybe I'll come to this chart here, uh, the desire to be near the people that they're attached to. So children want to be near uh, their caregiver. That's usually where they feel most comfortable. Um, now safe haven and secure base, these are similar terms, um, but with a slight difference. So safe haven is the idea that um, when the child is in maybe an unfamiliar setting, maybe you're at the park or at a play, I don't know, some kind of play activity, uh, play date, but in an unfamiliar place. Um, if something scary happens or something that the child isn't sure about, they run right back to their attachment figure for safety and comfort. So maybe you're at the park, the baby kind of wanders off, they're looking at different things, and then all of a sudden they hear a loud dog bark, they run right back to their 
attachment, primary attachment figure that becomes their safe haven. They feel good there. Um, similarly, they use the attachment figure as a secure base, meaning the attachment figure is a base of security from which the child can explore the surrounding environment. So again, being in an unfamiliar place, again, let's say a park, at first, the child will be right by um, the attachment figure's side. They won't leave. Maybe, again, you may have had experience with a young child. I can tell you with my own children, it's like you're almost stepping on them because they just won't leave your side. And then they will start to venture out a little bit. Um, they might take a few steps out, look around, and then come right back to your side. Okay, that went okay. Then maybe they take another few more steps out and then run right back to your side. The attachment figure is that secure base where they feel as though they can start to explore. They explore a little bit and then they come right back. And then separation distress. This is the anxiety that occurs in the absence of the attachment figure. So when a parent or caregiver drops a child off for daycare or at the babysitters or something like that and the child is screaming and crying because they aren't going to the their attachment figure their parent their caregiver has left that separation distress it's extremely hard when you're leaving your child and you're hearing all this crying but it's actually good it means they've got a secure attachment to you as their caregiver and so this attachment dance goes on where the caregiver and infant respond emotionally to each other in a very sensitive, attuned way. This is optimal. Um, Ainsworth and Belby suggest parent sensitivity to the baby's signals are really the foundation for a secure attachment, that a parent is really aware of those small signals that the child is giving out. Um, the goal is for that secure attachment. There are different pathways to those insecure attachments, avoidant, ambivalent, disorganized. And you can see these pictures. Here's a mother who's having a very hard time and she's really too depressed to connect with her baby. So the baby may be giving off signals, I'm hungry, I'm tired, but the mom is really struggling um, and isn't there is maybe um, avoidant is not responsive because she's got too much else going on um, with herself. Um, also, you can have a very difficult child, um, a very difficult child who has temperamental vulnerabilities, one of those difficult children who cry all the time. Um, a parent might start, maybe even try to start giving the child what they need and listening to the signals and eventually give up because the child is just so difficult, they can't figure out how to please this child, and so they give up. Again, that could lead to an insecure attachment because the child is learning, hey, I'm not getting anything I need here. Um, or the caregiver's other attachment relationships make it difficult to do the dance with the baby. Oh, these people look very unhappy with each other. So family, parents who are fighting all the time and can't really pay attention to the child or don't really pay attention to the child. Um, all sorts of things can happen um, where it becomes difficult for the caregiver to look at those signals that the child is sending out and do that synchronicity dance. It's a challenge. It's a challenge for everyone. And when there are particular difficulties in the household, um, with the child's temperament or with the parent themselves, um, this can be very, very difficult. So in terms of a quick summary of attachment, infancy has this special zone of sensitivity um, for our ability to form relationships. And what we find is that early attachment styles really lay the foundation for healthy or unhealthy development. And these attachment styles um, predict uh, many things later in life, even into adulthood. Um, so this early attachment is very important. Now, attachment styles may change over time. Life stress might change attachment from secure to insecure. Maybe everything was going well and there was a secure attachment when the baby was born. And then, I don't know, the parents get divorced and the mom or dad is a 
depressed and anxious and moving and all of a sudden they can't pay attention to those baby signals and we go from insecure to insecure attachment. But responsive caregiving can change attachment from insecure to secure. So it's good to know you kind of can go in either direction. And as we said, forces that influence attachment style, um, the nurturing provided by the primary caregiver, the infant's temperament, or any other environmental forces. All right. Um, moving on to um, a totally different topic, poverty and development. Um, here are some research findings that during childhood, poverty may compromise health. Um, children may be more likely to be born lower at birth weight. Um, mom may be more stressed. Parents may be more stressed. Um, and that can cause chronically elevated levels of the stress hormone called cortisol. Cortisol is our stress hormone. And so um, poverty can lead to children who have this elevated level of cortisol for long periods of time. What we find with uh, cortisol is that in short bursts, because it is our stress hormone, it's actually helpful, right? Cortisol is released in a stressful situation and helps you deal with that stressful situation. But long-term chronic stress, where you have long-term chronic elevated levels of cortisol, actually seems to be um, not good for health, the immune system, even uh, brain development. So that can be um, one of the negative impacts of a child growing up in poverty. Uh, poverty may have a long-term educational impact. Poverty during the first four years of life makes it statistically less likely for a child to graduate from high school. Again, statistically less likely doesn't mean it doesn't happen. It certainly does. Um, the children certainly do go to college even if they had um, experienced poverty early in life, but it's a statistical, statistically significant uh, difference. And they also may enter school left behind. Um, they may have less access to quality preschools, enriching toys, trips to museums, things like that. And so when they get to kindergarten, their peers are already ahead of them. And so they're already struggling. And then, as you know, school builds, every grade builds. And if you're already behind at the beginning, it can be harder to catch up. Beyond that, they might have less space to learn. And when we mean space, we need like, we mean like a good, quiet place to focus. Um, so they may have housing where there's not enough room. They may have many people living in the house. It can be very noisy. Um, they can never have a, a quiet place to, to concentrate, could be a dangerous neighborhood, um, et cetera. And then that can also, again, lead to these negative impacts on education. Uh, there are some interventions to help give uh, these children an intellectual and social boost. There's the Head Start program. This is a federal program that offers high quality daycare and other services to children aged three to five years from low income families. And the goal is to help prepare children for entrance to kindergarten. And there's now even an early Head Start program that provides counseling and other services to low income parents and children under the age of three. So there are programs there um, to try to help combat some of the potentially negative effects of um, low income. One thing that I think is really important um, in the, being a neuropsychologist and understanding brain development is that cognitive stimulation in the home or in child, the child care environment is extremely important for brain development. And when I say cognitive stimulation, I mean anything. So it can be toys, um, it can be books, uh, visual auditory stimulation, encouragement play, readings, discussions. And what I want you to notice is that not all of this costs money, right? Reading material, books that come from a library. I mean, it could be reading something on your phone, 
um, on your cell phone, on your computer, that really is just there um, for free. Um, talking, uh, visual and auditory stimulation, playing music, talking to your child, that's it. Just simply talking to your child will stimulate brain development. Um, visual, so putting up pictures on the wall. Again, this doesn't have to be art, um, amazing art pieces, but it can be something you print off the internet, a picture of a dog, a picture of a cat, and maybe even write the letters, C-A-T, D-O-G, on the pictures. And so there's something to look at. Um, for my children, <laughs> I hung little hooks in the ceiling and with fishing line, um, hung little tiny stuffed animals from the ceiling. So when they were laying in their cribs, there was something to look at. They were always moving, right? The air conditioner, whatever the heater's on. And so they're kind of moving, they're turning around, they're different colors, things like that. Um, just discussing things with your child. Um, again, with my children, it was just a constant discussion. Now mommy is doing the dishes. Oh boy, you know, this glass is very dirty. Just hearing things, seeing things, those are all ways to stimulate your child. And this cognitive stimulation is correlated with school readiness, with higher IQ, better reading skills, and better general knowledge. And for me, this is really important to understand because children from disadvantaged homes can do a lot of these things. As I said, it doesn't cost money, it doesn't have to cost money, and it can be very simple, but a very effective way to provide this kind of stimulating environment. Now, what about daycare? That's a big issue um, in the infant and toddler period. And you can just see here that um, we've got 27% of infants and toddlers um, who stay with their parent, um, who are cared for by their parent during the day, 27% by a relative, 22% in a daycare setting, 17% in a family daycare, sorry, this is a daycare center, um, and 7% with a nanny or a babysitter. So you can see that many children are not cared for by their parents during the day. So what do we know about child care um, and development? There's a long study that's gone on in the National Institute of Child Health and Human Development for, of early child care. This is a multi-multi-year study. And what they find is that children in, in child care, uh, most infants in daycare are securely attached. So maybe there's a fear that you, these children will not be able to securely attach. That's not what the research finds. They find secure attachment. Um, having a sensitive parent is the best predictor of secure attachment at age one. Um, so even if the child is in daycare, um, having just a sensitive, caring parent is a predictor of a secure attachment. Uh, we do find higher cortisol levels. Remember, that's the stress hormone and a higher risk um, of teenage acting out for middle-class children who do full-time daycare versus family care. So again, this is now a correlation. It's not a cause and effect, but you do, we do see this um, relationship. Other things the study has found, um, not surprisingly, higher quality child care um, compared to lower quality child care. So the children in higher quality child care have better language abilities, better cognitive development, and more cooperative. And what do we mean by higher quality? This would be um, looking at the amount of uh, teachers to uh, children, um, what kind of cognitive stimulation is there, what kind of toys are there, what is the environment like, et cetera. Um, we see that higher quantity of child care, and this is compared to lower quantity, so a child who spends more hours in child care show more acting out behaviors until age 15. Um, and you may see less secure attachment, even though most are secured, they're securely attached um, 
there's still a, an effect here. But, and again, this is not cause and effect. This is correlational. There's just an association. And you could think, right? Children who spend more hours in child care show more acting out behaviors than children who spend less hours in child care. What other reasons could it be? It could be just being in child care, but there could be other reasons why you see these more acting out behaviors. Maybe it's parenting. Maybe it's that these parents are um, working more and so they get home and they're exhausted and there are less rules. And so that child is kind of acting out more because they don't have as many rules um, and as kind of as much structure and guidance maybe as they need from their parent. So there's lots of potential reasons. All we know is there's this association. But what I really like is that parent characteristics are more strongly linked to child development than child care features. And I think this is really important, particularly in uh, today's day and age where there's often two working parents. Um, that is the parent characteristics that are more strongly linked to child development than the child care features that parenting experiences are as important to children independent of the amount of childcare experience, which means you can't say, oh, my child's in daycare from, I don't know, 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. So when I get home, I don't really have to worry about parenting too much. They've done it at the daycare center. No, what you do as a parent with your child is important in their development, more so than the daycare setting. Um, so parenting is very important. And as a parent, I find that very uplifting. Um, in terms of choosing childcare, what should you consider? Um, overall, consider who the caregiver is. Get to know who that person is that will be taking care of your child. Ask about the stability of uh, the staff. Is there a lot of turnover? Remember that attachment is really important. So it's really nice if there are people who have been there for many years and expect to be there for the time that your child will be there. Check the ratio of caregivers to children and look at the physical setting. Again, what are the walls all blank and boring or are there pictures on the walls or what kind of books are available, toys, what's the playground? You're looking for stimulation and of course you're looking for safety. Um, behavioral theory of personality development, from this perspective, emotions and personality are all molded um, as parents reinforce or punish a child. This is the idea of behaviorism, right? That parents reinforce a child who smiles, the child will develop a sunny personality, right? So the child smiles and you go, oh, how cute you are. That's amazing. Oh my goodness. I love that smile. Well, that's positive reinforcement and the child will likely keep smiling, right? But the opposite is true as well. Uh, maybe a child who doesn't get a lot of attention but notices when they um, do something wrong, all of a sudden their parent is right there paying attention to them. Um, they realize, oh, this is how I can get attention, right? Um, so I'm going to misbehave because that's the way I can get my parents' attention. Or um, what, when a, uh, if a child is very afraid of things and the child gets afraid and then runs to their caregiver and, oh, it's okay, honey, I've got you, you're fine, then they, that's some positive reinforcement for being afraid. And so you may see much, a much more fearful child. And you can see how these different theories of personality development are so radically different, right? With Freud's psychoanalytic theory, um, personality develops if an infant receives oral gratification, right? And it's, is able to get through this oral stage appropriately. Um, whereas with Erickson, we're talking about trust versus mistrust and learning to establish trust being important for, um, personality development. Behavioral therapy, we're just talking about reinforcement and that what's reinforced is the type of personality that child will um, end up with. 
And you can see this is a quote from Watson, who was a behaviorist, right? The kind of the father of behaviorism from 1928 to 72. Failure to bring up a happy child, a well-adjusted child, assuming bodily health, falls squarely upon the parent's shoulders. Gosh, no pressure, right? By the time the child is three, parents have already determined whether the child is grown into a happy person, wholesome and good-natured, whether he is to be a whining, complaining, neurotic, an anger-driven, vindictive, overbearing slave driver, or one whose every move in life is definitively controlled by fear. Boy, right? There's all of that pressure on the parents in this behavioral theory. And I would ask you to think, are you a behaviorist? Do you think parents have total control over whether their child will be well-adjusted or not? You can think about that. Um, socialization, lastly, in this um, section, this is the process by which children are taught to obey the norms of society and behave in socially appropriate ways. And so it doesn't really happen during infancy, but into toddlerhood, we're trying to teach children rules and what's acceptable behavior. Um, and the idea of self-regulation um, is kind of stopping yourself. Maybe what you want to do, you need to kind of regulate your own drives, your own pleasure at that particular moment um, to because it's not appropriate, right? If you're in preschool and you're hungry, you can't just scream, I'm hungry, I'm hungry, I need to eat. Um, you got to learn the rules that there's snack time and then there's dinner time. But this is very difficult at age two. Um, between two and four, self-regulation improves dramatically. What they do find is exuberant, joyful, fearless toddlers are more difficult to socialize. They don't care much as much about the rules. Um, they're just happy to do whatever they want. They're not afraid of consequences. They're not afraid of um, maybe doing what other people aren't doing. And so teaching them the rules of socialization can be more difficult. So in terms of socialization, parents and caregivers begin to teach children the norms of society, how to behave in socially appropriate ways about at the age of two years old. Socialization is more successful if parents utilize a goodness of fit model, and we've used this term before, goodness of fit. Um, and this is the idea that the parenting strategy involves arranging the child's environment to suit their temperament. And this minimizes the vulnerabilities and maximizes their strengths. So think about this. I think I have a picture here. If we've got the child's temperament and the child's environment, and we're working on socialization, working on trying to help the child learn kind of the rules and expectations of society. So if you have a very um, extroverted child, trying to teach them and take them maybe to um, a very quiet art class or library reading class um, might not be very easy. Um, but so if you've got this very outgoing child, then maybe this is a child you take to sports classes, you take to soccer, and they will learn the rules of listen to an adult, um, uh, take be nice to other children, um, but in an environment that allows them to run around and express their um, outgoing personality, right? Um, a quiet child, a more shy child, um, that child, maybe again, you want to take them to an art class or a music class or a, a library reading time where that's a more comfortable place for them to be just generally with the, their temperament. But again, they will learn um, socialization, listening to the teacher, um, following rules, raising your hand to ask a question, those sorts of things. And so that's the idea of goodness of fit when, when you're starting with socialization is to think about your child's temperament and put them in an environment that makes that process a little bit easier for that child because socialization and teaching rules is hard. So if at least you have the child in a place where they feel comfortable, they'll be more apt to be able to um, be successful at learning those rules. Um, 
And then, of course, as they get older, they've got to branch out from their comfort zone, right? We're not saying keep them there forever, but that that's a good place to start. Um, how do we know that shy and exuberant children differ dramatically in self-control? Well, there are research findings on this that toddlers on the high end of the fearless, joyous, and angry continuum show less morality, and that is for sure in quotes. This means just being able to follow the rules of society by age four. Um, and so without having a strong inhibition or fear, impulses are difficult to control. So shy ch children are a little bit more easy to socialize than these exuberant kind of fearless children. It can be done, and that's the idea of trying to put those very um, extroverted children in an environment that allows them to be themselves while they're learning socialization. Keys to socializing a rambunctious toddler, um, offering a lot of positive guidance, trying to set clear limits. We talked about arranging the child's environment to suit their temperamental style um, and accentuating their strengths. That's really key. All right, everybody. Thank you very much.